for the final video of muscle contraction and relaxation, um, I'm not going to draw any diagrams this time. Instead, I'm going to teach this material to you guys, the entire idea of muscle contraction and relaxation through a flow chart. So we're going to travel back through neuromuscular junction, excitation, contraction, coupling, cross-bridge cycling in a flow chart using key words and nothing but key words to describe this. And what I want you guys to do is potentially even pull out some of the previous notes that you took on the past videos of mine, those drawings that you made, and try to follow along with the flow chart. Because everything that I verbalized in those videos in terms of the step-by-step -step process, that's what we're going to be doing with this flow chart. Where does the muscle contraction start with? starts with an action potential. And that action potential is being sent from the nervous system. So that action potential is being tra is traveling down an axon and it reaches the bouton. And on the bouton, what does it do? John and I are a little bit shorter. On the bouton, what does it do? It activates a voltage-gated calcium channel. Now, what I want you guys to notice is that I'm leaving some keywords out. And I do this intentionally, and I'd like for you guys to try to do certain things like this intentionally when you're studying, because when you leave certain things out, the rest has to be filled in by your brain when you study. So instead of reading just action potential, your brain should be converting this into, this is an action potential from the nervous system, traveling down a somatic nervous system axon, and it makes it to the terminal bouton. And on the terminal bouton, we activate the voltage-gated calcium channel. I don't want to write in terminal bouton every time. I don't want to have to write in somatic nervous system every time. So get in the habit of creating key words. And now, when you're studying this using key words, the rest of it comes to your mind and, oh crap, all of a sudden you're learning rather than memorizing. Key to learning is doing things minimally. Don't write out entire paragraphs of stuff. Please, everybody that's watching, get into the habit, the good study habits, study habits of key words. Because when the voltage-gated calcium channel opens, what do we know happens next? Because calcium is higher concentration outside the bouton than inside, now calcium starts to rush into the bouton. What do we call this? Calcium influx. So calcium now enters the bouton, and when it does, that increase in the calcium concentration inside of the bouton is going to cause the next step to occur. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just draw the arrow down, wrap it around, and I'm going to say this allows for an increase in the exocytosis of acetylcholine. Let me back up a second because sometimes I forget not everybody's seen my abbreviations before. This is an A with an arrow up which means activation. Get in the habit of doing shorthands. You don't want to have to write increase and decrease all the time. So write an arrow up or an arrow down. You don't want to write the word concentration all the time. So use brackets and in physics and in chemistry and in science brackets around a word tell you concentration. So it's going to increase the exocytosis of acetylcholine, which now enters the synaptic cleft. But I don't want to have to write that. Okay, so what I'm going to say in my mind is that the acetylcholine enters the synaptic cleft and diffuses down to the motor end plate. And on the motor end plate, it's going to activate nicotinic receptors. You guys are going to have to fill up, figure out what comfort, uh, the comfort level for you. If you need to add in that it crosses the synaptic cleft, diffuses, and therefore binds the nicotinic receptors, then you add that to your flow chart. Put in the steps you feel like you need in order to learn it, and then start taking those steps out as you study. As you activate the nicotinic receptors, this allows for sodium to enter the cell faster than potassium leaves. Therefore, we have a net intracellular sodium influx that causes an end plate potential. That end plate potential travels 
to the sarcolemma, and on the sarcolemma, it's going to activate voltage-gated sodium channels and creates new action potentials. So I'm going to write creates action potentials on sarcolemma. Again, you don't even need to write sarcolemma or anything along those lines. You can just say increases action potentials if you know what the heck you're talking about. What I want to point out is everything that we've done so far, the action potentials to the EPP, all of this that I am circling, this is all the neuromuscular junction. So we just summarize that into a short little flow chart where I spent 20 minutes or whatever on another video trying to crash course you on it. Once we create the action potentials on the sarcolemma, this is the beginning of the ECC. And this action potential is going to travel down the T-tubules and it's going to activate those dihydroperidine, the DHP, in the T-tubules. And when the DHP become activated, they have that link protein, that chain spring-like protein that now opens the ryanidine receptor. And when the ryanidine receptor opens, calcium floods out of the SR. Massive flood of calcium. Calcium floods out of the SR. We're not going to write calcium efflux or influx because the SR is already inside the cell. So we don't want to try to confuse ourselves with those words. We're going to say calcium floods out of the SR. And why is that important? Because as calcium floods out of the SR, that calcium is now going to the sarcomere underneath. And it's binding to the key protein of the sarcomere that has the calcium binding site. Hopefully you guys are remembering which one that is. That's troponin, right? So we're now dealing with calcium binding to troponin. So calcium now activates troponin. And when troponin gets activated, that starts the cross bridge cycle. So everything up to this point right here, so everything here, creation of the action potentials, to in essence, when calcium binds to troponin, depends on your professor, how they teach this, whether or not this is part of the ECC, right? This is excitation, contraction, coupling. Some professors might say that it ends at when calcium floods out of the SR, which is technically true, but I like to think about the coupling process. So now calcium binds to troponin, and this really starts the entire cross-bridge cycling. Cross-bridge cycling has to do with how the myosin head is acting on this, but it really doesn't occur. I'm going to go ahead and continue my ECC actually out to the complete coupling. The myosin uh, cross-bridge interaction doesn't really occur until the tropomyosin has been shifted off of that myosin binding site. So that's what we're going to draw in here. Calcium activates troponin that shifts the tropomyosin off of the myosin binding site. Now, as long as myosin has hydrolyzed ATP into ADP and intergranular phosphate, as long as myosin is in the high energy state, now myosin gets to bind to actin. So we're going to go ahead and say at this point, coupling is over. And we are always going to make an assumption that you're alive. Right, I hope that's a good assumption too, right? Because as long as you're alive, you have ATP in the system. And as long as there's ATP in the system, then the myosin, which is sitting in the high energy state, can, uh, which, uh, sorry, 
then the myosin will be in the high energy state, right? So as long as there's ATP in the system, we're going to we assume ATP is present. And if so, then myosin, and actually let's change that to high energy myosin, then high energy myosin binds to the myosin binding site on actin. Tropomyosin ships out the myosin binding site on actin, therefore the high energy myosin, the myosin head, binds to actin. And when that happens, the next step is inorganic phosphate falls off. Inorganic phosphate is released, and the myosin head binds tighter. Then, ADP falls off. That's not a D. Huh. And this is what causes the power stroke. Actually, let's draw that over to the right. Power stroke. And during the power stroke, the actin gets moved along the myosin head. Gets moved along by the myosin head. The Z discs start to shorten and the actin moves towards the M line. Following the power stroke, we go into our cycle. Following the power stroke, ATP is going to bind back to that myosin head. So ATP is hydrolyzed, and that is going to set this back into the high energy myosin head, which continues to bind to actin and causes the contraction of the muscle. Cool. Old man syndrome. Okay, I'm back up now. So. This is a flow chart of the entire muscle contraction, but you can see up above I wrote relaxation. Dr. H, you didn't leave yourself any room for relaxation. How are we going to do that? Oh, so, listen, that's the beauty of flow charts. Flow charts, they teach you the one way. So if you learn this in terms of this is what causes contraction, what do we need to do to cause relaxation? We need to get rid of all of this, don't we? And that's the beauty of flowcharts now. By the way, everything that's down here, everything that's down here, that I'm going to circle in purple, we're going to go ahead and call this the crossbridge cycling. It's also known as the sliding filament uh, theory, which is how I learned it back in the day. But I see a lot more textbooks calling it cross-bridge cycling nowadays. So how do we get relaxation? Well, what if we decrease, and I'm going to put this in <laughs> a nice, robust color that's different than everything else. So I'm going to try to use this pink and see if that works. Okay. How do we cause relaxation? Relaxation is going to be in pink on here. Okay, so how do we cause relaxation? What do we first need to do? Decrease the number of action potentials. What's that going to do to the activation of the voltage-gated calcium channel? Decrease. What's that going to do to calcium influx? Decrease. What's that going to do to the concentration of calcium in the bouton? Due to calcium pumps, The calcium concentration inside of the bouton starts to decrease. Don't forget about those calcium pumps. They're important in that regulation. This decreases the excess cytosis of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft, 
But we're not done here yet, because now what we have to think about is that we need to get rid of the acetylcholine that's in that cleft. And how can we get rid of that acetylcholine? We're going to have acetylcholine esterase. And the acetylcholine esterase breaks down the acetylcholine, thus decreasing the activation of the nicotinic receptors. What does that do to net and sodium influx? Decrease. What does that do to the number of end plate potentials? Decrease. What does that do to the creation of action potentials on the sarcolemma? Decrease. You guys see why flowcharts are so nice? They limit the amount of studying you have to do. What happens to the activation of DHP? Decrease. What happens to the RYR? It closes. Calcium's no longer flooding out, therefore calcium activation of the troponin, well, that stops. And the rest of this system stops. As long as the calcium now goes back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, okay, calcium gets pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum again by calcium pumps, that removes the calcium from the ICF. That's going to decrease the calcium concentration inside of that muscle fiber. Therefore, we stop tropomyosin from shifting. It covers that myosin binding site, and it freezes the crossbridge cycling. I certainly hope this is helpful. Make sure you're not just studying flowcharts. Make sure you're not just studying diagrams. Make sure you're studying everything together. All right. As I always like to say, humankind, be both. Be nice to your neighbors. Be nice to everybody. And uh, pass on the knowledge. See you in the next video.